Professor Christopher Mitchell is, is director of the Drusy French Kumbi Professor of International Conflict Analysis at George Mason University in Virginia, where he was also director of that university's Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution from 1991 to 1994. Mitchell continues to work on practical and theoretical aspects of peacemaking processes and has recently published articles on the theory of entrapment, on ending asymmetric conflicts, and on a multi-role model of mediation. His most recent works are Gestures of Conciliation, Factors Contributing to Olive Branches, and Handbook of Conflict Resolution, The Analytical Problem-Solving Approach. He's held academic positions at the University College London, the London School of Economics, and the Uni University of Southampton. Mitchell was appointed lecturer in the Department of Systems Science at City University in 1973, became Professor of International Relations there in 1983, he uh, joined the academic exodus from Britain in the mid-1980s, and uh, I believe this is, is a fourth official trip to Utah, third or fourth? Fourth at least. Fourth at least. Um, he's been a visiting fellow here at the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies, and uh, we owe a great debt to uh, Ray and Carolyn Hillam. Uh, Ray was a former director of uh, the Kennedy Center. You see his picture up on the wall there, and we're glad to have Ray and Carolyn with us here today. They, uh, we're instrumental in bringing uh, Christopher to BYU previously uh, in a different era, and uh, we're grateful to bring him back today and, and to hear what he has to say. His topic today is Building Local Peace Amid Civil War, the Columbian Experience. Please join me in welcoming Professor Christopher Mitchell. Thank you, Corey. Um, it, it is very nice to be back on campus again for my fourth or fifth visit. And I'd like to sort of just say a word of thanks to Corey and Jeff, as well as to my old friends Ray and Caroline, uh, for letting me you know, virtually gate crash my way in here. Uh, you know, it, it sort of took the form of my sending an email saying, I'll be in Salt Lake City on such and such a date. What about offering me? Uh, a lecture spot, and then I can come down and see you. you know, sort of, it's known as subtle blackmail. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about today is some work uh, that arises out of a project that we've been uh, undertaking at my university, you know, which is George Mason University in uh, Virginia, which I'm sure none of you had heard of until last year when they did really rather well in the National Basketball Association Championships. But since then, that put us on the map. Um, the project that we've been working on is uh, trying to understand something about the way in which local communities uh, who are caught up in the middle of often quite violent and protracted civil wars, sometimes on occasions decide to declare themselves neutral uh, or set themselves up as a peace zone or a peace community or sometimes they're called community, sometimes zone, sometimes a humanitarian area. The names vary. Uh, and we have been concentrating for some time now, for about the last five or six years, on peace communities in Colombia. Uh, I'll come to why in a, in a few minutes, why Colombia. Um, the actual history of the project goes back, though, to the early 1990s and uh, had actually nothing whatsoever to do with Colombia or many of the other places that subsequently became the focus of our research. Um, it so happened that a colleague of mine and one of my uh, ABD doctoral students uh, was on a visit, we, we were on a visit to Armenia. Uh, this was just after um, the Soviet Union had sort of begun to collapse and various parts of the, uh, the empire had sort of um, drifted away and become independent. <laughs> Uh, and Armenia had become independent, uh, oh, possibly, I think, three years before we got there. Uh, we were invited by the um, uh, State University of Yerevan, uh, the capital of Armenia, to come over for a couple of weeks and introduce the idea of what they insisted upon calling conflictology, which I could never spell, um, and beginning a, a program in their Department of Psychology. Um, and at the very end of the, of the two weeks, uh, which was a, an interesting experience because they were in a pause uh, in a quite violent war which they'd started about a year earlier uh, with their neighboring republic, uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, 
uh, over the political control of a chunk of Azerbaijan up near the border called Nagorno-Karabakh. So there had been a war. Uh, the, the Azeris had promptly cut off all the supplies of natural gas coming down to Armenia, uh, which made life a bit hard in Yerevan because that was their only source of power, uh, aside from a, an old Soviet-style nuclear power station which had been closed down because it had been hit by an earthquake three years before. So there was, there was almost no power in, in Yerevan. Now, there are notices on the lift saying, don't use this. Um, anyway, towards the end of the, the two weeks, uh, our hosts at the university said, would we like to go up to the border and have a look at some of the um, results of the previous year's combat? Uh, now, you know, cowardice being my middle name, I thought, this is not a good idea. But we were guests, so the three of us got piled into a, uh, a bus and driven up to the border, uh, to one of the border towns, uh, where you could see some of the results of the fighting. There were sort of shell holes in the building, and um, just up the road was the, the border with Azerbaijan. Uh, and the local uh, administration uh, really were very hospitable. Uh, they took us around the place, and they showed us uh, some of the refugees that had come across from Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and then they took us to what turned out to be the most sumptuous meal I've had for a very long time, at which, being Armenia, there were toasts and there were speeches and there were welcomes and one thing or another. And the very last speech that was given uh, was given by the local mayor of the town, who was a very impressive lady, let me tell you. I mean, she was you know, very, very intelligent, well-organized, she knew what she wanted, she was pretty tough. Uh, and at the end of her speech, uh, she turned to us and said, of course, the current situation is absolutely ridiculous because just down the road is now an international border, whereas three years ago, it was simply an administrative border between two of the Soviet republics. Mm -hmm. I know the people on the other side of the border almost as well as I know people in my town. I can pick up the telephone, I can talk to the, to the mayor on that side of the border in the nearer border town. And what we are trying to do between us is, irrespective of what happens between our two governments, is we're trying to arrange for a neutral zone to be set up along this border so that we don't actually get involved in violence again. Uh, they want it on their side of the border, we want it on our side of the border. Now, she said, turning to us and fixing us with a, a gaze which I could only describe as being mm -hmm. expectant. You people are, of course, experts upon conflict resolution, and you must know something about setting up peace zones along borders. Could you please advise us? And then she sat down, and everybody looked at us. And we looked at each other, and we had, of course, also been indulging in the Armenian process of toasting. <laughs> to a large extent, uh, neither of us were, was in a fit state to give any advice about anything. <laughs> Fortunately, the third member of our party, our ABD student, was a not untypical member of the GMU student body. He was a former colonel in the United States Army. So he got up and started to give some very good advice about how you actually controlled uh, zones in which weapons were not allowed, uh, where fighting was banned, where communications were essential in order to tell what was going on, communications between two warring parties. And this appeared to satisfy our hosts, thank heaven. But coming away from that meeting, I said to my colleague, Dennis Sandoli, do you know anything about peace zones and neutral zones? And he said, you've got to be joking. I don't know anything about it. And I said, neither do I, and maybe we should. Uh, let's, when we get back home, try and find out something about the establishment of neutral zones, peace zones, uh, zones where arms are banned. I mean, there must be something. And... That actually pushed us in the direction, when we did get back, of, of starting to look at this whole idea of local peace zones. Um, we held a conference a couple of years later to which we invited people from the United Nations who had been in uh, Cyprus and were at that stage trying to set up protected zones in Yugoslavia, some of which you may have read about. 
uh, and some of the tragedies that ensued when many of those zones collapsed in places like Sarajevo, for example. Um, we also uh, uh, had a number of people from the Philippines who said yes, there were peace zones in the Philippines, in Luzon. There were beginning to be some talk about putting some peace, uh, some peace communities in Mindanao in the south. Uh, because at that time there was a major war going on between the Moro Lib uh, National Liberation Front uh, and the Philippine government. Uh, we had some people from uh, Central America who said, well, we didn't call them peace zones, we called them zonas de resistencia, uh, and they're different. So it dawned on us that, uh, you know, if you use the word peace zones or peace communities, you're talking about a wide variety of things ranging from you know, small villages in Guatemala that had declared themselves neutral in the Guatemalan Civil War, usually with not very positive results, right the way through to the idea of declaring the whole of Latin America or the whole of the Indian Ocean as a nuclear-free zone. People talked about peace zones, and they could mean any of those things. So we decided that we really ought to sort of be a little bit more focused and a little bit more concentrated in our efforts. Uh, you know, we're a small, relatively small research organization, though we do try to do research and teaching and practice, which perhaps explains why we were in Armenia. Um, and so um, we thought, you know, we have limited resources, though we did manage to get a small grant of the US Institute of Peace to support this work. Uh, we better try and focus on something a bit more limited than that wide range of possibilities. Um, a lot of what we do at the, my institute sort of tends to be student driven. Um, and by that I mean um, we get a lot of students from all over the world, as, as you do here at Brigham Young University. Um, I suspect our students are a certain degree more what the British call bloody-minded than you get here, because they tend to come along and they say things like, well, you know, you're supposed to be an institute for conflict analysis and resolution. What are you doing about my country where there are the following problems? Now, around about this time, we actually began to get a number of students in from Latin America, which was new for us. Uh, pre previously, we'd really not had many students from that part of the world. And particularly, there were three or four of them coming from Colombia. And they said more or less that. Do you know what's going on in Colombia? Well, you jolly well ought to know what's going on in Colombia. Why aren't you doing something about Colombia? Uh, and one of them said, you know that there is an organization in, um, uh, in Bogota, in Colombia, which is starting to do something practical about the very things that you guys are talking about, namely, they have this project called 100 Municipalities of Peace. And what they're trying to do is to take a model which they have derived from the experience of a municipality called Magotes in Santander, which is in central Colombia. Uh, and um, they're trying to use this to help local communities opt out of the war in Colombia. Uh, I'm assuming everybody knows where Colombia is, but just in case you've forgotten. That's not bad. Uh, it's a fascinating and very beautiful country in Latin America. It borders Panama in the north. In fact, Panama used to be part of Colombia until uh, US foreign policy at the beginning of the century decided to um, help the Panamanians break away and set up the Panama Canal. Uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, uh, Brazil. Uh, it's a country which is very difficult to get around uh, traditionally. It's split by two very substantial mountain ranges, and a number of rivers which mainly run north-south. And this means that it tends to be very much a country which is difficult to govern from the center. Um, there's a lot of sort of local particularism and independence. Um, for example, if you are in the second city of Medellin uh, and you ask for uh, the kind of beer that they serve down in Bogota, which of course none of you will, 
Uh, the people from Medellin will explain to you very gently that they don't sell that kind of beer. They only sell beer which is properly made in Medellin. Um, it's, I guess it's sort of like you know, Texas and um, Massachusetts or something like that. Um, it's also a country which, if you talk to some of the Colombians, they will say, we've had a civil war in this country for 40 years, 50 years since 1948. There was a period from 1948 to the end of the 1950s which they called La Violencia, uh, which was a civil war between sort of traditional forces supporting the two major traditional political parties, the Liberal Party, which isn't particularly liberal, and the Conservative Party, which is highly conservative. Um, they are a country that has suffered violence widespread violence, though often of very different sorts in different parts of the country, as I say, since 1948. It's gone through about four cycles. Um, and it's a country that, of course, is probably best known in the United States as being the source of most of the cocaine that comes in uh, into this country, um, which is an additional complicating factor. Uh, at the moment, um, I could go on about sort of Colombian history for the next three or four hours, so I won't. At the moment, the situation is that um, the country is still in major levels of turmoil, uh, high levels of violence, uh, less so in the cities now because the current president has managed to at least co control some of the violence in the cities. Um, but the violence involves the national security forces, uh, the Colombian army. Um, two major left-wing guerrilla organizations, one called FARC, F-A-R-C, uh, Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionario Colombiano. You'll have to excuse my Spanish accent, it's pretty lousy. Uh, and the other smaller organization called ELN. Um, which stands for National Liberation Army, and I won't try that in Spanish. Um, the other major <coughs> paramilitary force um, consists of uh, a number of paramilitaries organizations under the umbrella of the um, Auto Defensas Unidas de Colombia, the AUC, uh, which uh, is an organization which works with the army uh, and originally was set up by some of the large landowners uh, in order to combat the guerrillas who had a tendency to fund their operations by kidnapping. Colombia is the country which I think has the highest number of kidnapped personnel and the highest number of internally displaced personnel in the world. Uh, the very first paramilitary organization was set up by landowners up in uh, the north of the country, in Oruba, and it was called um, Death to Kidnappers. It was called the MAS, Muerta a, Muerto a Secuestradores. Um, and that sort of gradually over the years transmogrified itself into a large number of um, local self-defense paramilitary forces uh, who whose proximity to gangsterism is pretty close. Um, if you want another map, and you probably don't, but never mind. Um, this, is, this is where the various um, armed actors operate. You can see they operate throughout the country. Um, Never trust technology, my old professor used to say. Um, basically, the, um, the sort of, um, the, uh, the areas that you can see cross-hatched uh, and black are where the two guerrilla organizations were. The sort of areas which are dotted in uh, are areas where some of the paramilitaries operate. 
You can see they operate from the south of the country near the Ecuadorian border, where a lot of the coca is still grown. Uh, you can see that they operate up near the Atlantic coast, or maybe the Caribbean coast uh, in Uruba. Uh, they operate in uh, Medio Magdalena along the River Magdalena, which is one of the major routes throughout the country. And um, they periodically fight each other. But the problem, if you're a local campesino, or if you are a member of the Afro-Colombian community, and there are a large number of Afro-Colombians, former slaves in... Um, in Colombia, uh, or if you're a member of one of the indigenous peoples in Colombia, is that frequently you're not fought over or around. You become the target for some of the violence. Because quite frequently, and this is particularly so for the paramilitaries and also I think for the Colombian military, their objective is not necessarily immediately to defeat the guerrillas. It's to take over territory. Uh, and it's to take over territory on behalf of large landowners, large international companies, uh, people who wish to seize land uh, in order to um, turn it into cattle haciendas or in order to exploit some of the emeralds or in order to uh, grow African palm or bananas uh, and bring the whole economy, which is traditionally a sort of localized peasant economy, into the, into the global market. So that means that if you're indigenous, if you're Afro-Colombian, if you're simply somebody who lives in a village outside of uh, Barrancameja or um, one of the other major towns, your village is quite likely to become a battlefield and you're quite likely to be um, become the target of either side. Uh, we had somebody come to um, George Mason a couple of months ago who works for an organization called Peace Brigades International. And one of the things Peace Brigades International does is that they put people into these villages to accompany those individuals and those villages under major threat. And she came and she talked to us and she posed us this sort of problem. She said, supposing you're a, you know, supposing you're a peasant in a Colombian village and some people come out of, the, out of the local bush, the local jungle, you know, the local mountains, wherever you happen to be. Uh, yeah, and there are a dozen of them and they're sort of fairly raggedy and they're dressed in camouflage smocks, but you can't identify them. And they say, you know, we're hungry, can you give us something to eat? What do you do? Because these people may be guerrillas, or they may be paramilitaries, or they may be the kinds of uh, soldiers that the army employs as agents provocateurs to see who's with the guerrillas. Or, so you don't know who they are. But if you give them food and if you give them shelter, then you can bet your bottom dollar that in another three weeks, another group is going to come out of the jungle and say, we hear that you gave food and support to the guerrillas. You guys are obviously guerrilla sympathizers. Get out of here now. Leave. Or they'll say, uh, point out to us the people who helped those guys two weeks ago. And then I'll shoot them. So the dilemma for local people is what do you do about this? How can you preserve yourself? How can you preserve your life? How can you preserve your village? How can you have peace in the middle of civil war? And that was, this, that was the question we asked ourselves. Because if you had 100 municipalities of peace, if, if Redipath, the organization in Bogota, was trying to establish local peace, uh, was there a formula for success? What were some of the things that contributed to, to the likelihood that you would survive as a local peace community or a local peace zone? And that was what we set ourselves to try to, uh, that was the question we set ourselves to try to answer. What is, is there a formula for success? Are there things which make it easier or more difficult to survive in that kind of a situation? You've got to remember that for people in the 
rural areas of Colombia, and I suspect in many other places, because we got a lot of these ideas initially from looking at what had happened in Luzon in the Philippines, where a somewhat similar situation existed, where the conflict was between the armed forces of the Philippines and the New People's Army, uh, the sort of left-wing guerrillas that had been fighting in the Philippines, well, I guess from, <laughs> since Ray and my time. Um, a very long time, and we got, you know, we 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 looked at this, and and we said, well, how how can this work? Because in Colombia, you see, all right, if you want to set up a local peace community, a comunidad de paz, you got all these pressures on you. There's your community, and you're under pressure from the military, uh, who probably have very little time for you as a local community because up until 10 years ago, the whole area was controlled by the guerrillas, so obviously your guerrilla sympathizers. The national police, you're under pressure from the paramilitaries. Of course, if you come from an area where the land is valuable and unregistered because they're trying to get rid of you. Uh, or you're under pressure from the guerrillas. But not only that, You know, you're under pressure, you're under economic pressure as well. You know, you're under pressure from oil companies, from the National Oil Company, if you're, if you're unfortunate enough to live above an oil field. Um, if you're next door to some of the emerald fields, that's not a very good thing. Um, if you are... If you're next door to and living on territory which is very good for growing bananas or extending the banana fields, that's another reason for some people to want to get rid of you. So when we came to look at all of these, these 100 municipalities of peace, which Redipath said they were trying to support, and they were trying to help stay in being, stay safe, stay free, stay out of the violence. You can see that asking an, the question, how did they manage to do it, and what contributed to their being able to survive, turned out to be a very complicated situation to which there wasn't an easy answer. Okay. So we started to do some field research. We were very fortunate we had a Colombian anthropologist who was willing to stick her neck out and go to these places and interview people and say, how did you get set up? Why, why did you feel that you had to start? Why did you choose this particular course of action? Um, what have been some of the problems that you've hit since you started your peace community? Um, do you have any good answers to how do you negotiate with the local armed actors? Uh, is it easier or more difficult to negotiate with the guerrillas than the paramilitaries? Or is, is it easy to negotiate with the army, you know, with the local brigade commander? Um, have you got any ideas, any lessons that you could give to us that we could pass on to others? Um, and she ended up sort of interviewing people from about 20 or 30 of these communities uh, to try to get some answers to those questions. We started off by giving her, a, you know, we're social scientists, we give people, you know, standard interviews and things like that. Uh, so we gave Sara Ramirez, our field worker, you know, a standard interview. It was based on some, what turned out to be quite wrong assumptions. Um, let me just mention sort of three of them. Uh, and we very rapidly sort of had to change our focus to try and get some kind of a realistic handle on the situation that meant something to the local people. The first assumption that we got completely and utterly wrong uh, was that the major reason for forming oneself into a peace community or setting up a peace zone um, 
in Colombia they tend to call them experiencias de path, peace experiences. We all thought that, of course, the, the major reason has to be uh, to try to make yourself neutral in the civil war, to try and keep the violence outside. Mm -hmm. Now, it's perfectly true that, in fact, that's one reason, but the more we looked at these peace communities, the more we found that there were all sorts of other reasons. Now, some of you may have come across a Norwegian sociologist called Johan Galtung. Uh, Galtung it is who makes a, a, a distinction many, many years ago, which has become sort of almost standard in conflict analysis resolution, between what he calls negative peace and positive peace. And negative peace means an absence of violence. You know, you, you, you stop people you know, killing, beating up on one another. Positive peace is much more complicated. It has to do with peace and justice and development and establishing a society which is at peace, I guess in the sense of you know, the peace that passeth human understanding. Um, and what we found when we looked more closely at some of the peace zones in Colombia, yes, they were trying to opt out of the civil war, and they were finding that was difficult, but they had all sorts of other reasons as well. We kept coming across this expression, politicaria. What they were trying to do is replace a corrupt government system, a corrupt local government system that was run by some of the local people and had been run uh, for their own benefit, in which there was no democratic participation, in which development for everybody was totally neglected, uh, in which the election for municipal councils and the mayors were completely sewn up, uh, you know, in the good old Chicago fashion that, you know, vote early, vote often and we'll pay you. Um, so they were trying to reform that as well. So if we start talk, started to talk about success with them, they would say, oh yes, we've been successful. And you would say, well, what exactly does that mean? And they would then give you a whole list. Well, we now have town meetings. The elections are fair. We've got a woman's group. You know. We started to develop some stuff for the youth to do because if we don't develop stuff for the youth to do, they're going to go off and join the paramilitaries. Paramilitaries, incidentally, are thoroughly embedded in the drug trade. And they pay well. You know, they pay better than the army, they pay better than the police, they pay better than the guerrillas. Or they did until recently. Um, so success doesn't just mean you declare yourself off limits to violence, you declare yourself a peace zone, you declare yourself a peace community. Because quite often, the violence doesn't go down that much. You know, if you look at a place like San Jose de Apartado in the north of the country, you'll find that since they declared themselves a peace zone, something like 250 of them have been murdered in the last 10 years. Mainly by paramilitaries, sometimes by the army disguised, disguised as paramilitaries, sometimes by the guerrillas. So the, you know, turning yourself into a peace zone, as one of them once said, is rather like turning yourself into a target for everybody. Nobody likes you. you know, the army thinks you're a paramilitary, you're guerrilla supporters, the guerrillas think you're paramilitary supporters. You know. So, you know, success means different things. The second mistake we made was to underestimate these guys tremendously. We thought we were going to look at a whole set of little isolated villages in the, in the, in the distant parts of Colombia. They're much better than that. They're much more serious than that. Um, they very rapidly started to organize, organize themselves into region-wide associations of peace zones and to negotiate on a regional basis with some of the local commanders, the army commanders, the paramilitary commanders, the guerrilla commanders. So that was a major mistake that we made. We'd, we'd really sort of, we thought, we'd underestimated them. Um, Okay, the second thing, uh, sorry, that was the second thing. It was the second thing, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. All right, the third thing was that we, we actually found that we were dealing with very different kinds of communities. Um, we'd, we'd assumed that they'd be somewhat, you know, 100 municipalities of peace in the same country, even though it's a very, it has very different regions, surely they would, well, we found, of course, that every one of them was different. Every one of them had a different experience, a different history, mm -hmm. a different fortune in setting up their peace communities. And um, it was also the case that we actually sort of hadn't realized that there were at least two basic types of peace 
community and peace zone. There were those that had actually stayed put and set it up. And there were those that had been driven out, usually to a nearby town where they'd sat in the local football stadium for two years as refugees. And then some of them had decided, enough, we're going to go back, whatever, and we're going to declare ourselves a peace zone. And so they were returning often not to the place where they'd exactly come from, but to their region. They're going home. And that was a very different pro kind of a process. So the third mistake we made was to think, well, all of these things will be sort of similar to one another, and we can pull out some general lessons from them. Of course, we couldn't. OK, so where are we now? I mean, you know, we started off saying, let's, let's sort of get some general lessons about this. Um, and maybe, you know, if we can find out something useful, it will help people in future who are contemplating the possibility of taking this path out of desperation. You know, because frequently the choice that they're given is, um, you know, you join the guerrillas, you help the army, you leave, or you die. You know? And this is a sort of fifth way of doing it. So did we find out anything? Uh, let me just very quickly do four things, and then I'll, you can ask me some questions about this. Um, it seems to be frequently the case that if you ask the question, why do they start up, why do they take this particular course of action? Okay? And in many, many places, there seem to be what you could call a, a sort of stress trigger model. All of these communities are under tremendous pressure, obviously. You know, there's a blockade down the road which the paramilitaries have set up, and you can't get your stuff to market. All right? Three of your young people have been kidnapped by the FARC and are now FARC members in the eyes of everybody else. You know, there's a constant, constant pressure going on. But what seems to happen in many of them is that something happens which so outrages them that they decide that the only thing that they can do is to say, enough, we're not taking part in this anymore, whatever the consequences are. This is what we're going to do. Uh, one example I can give you actually isn't from Colombia, it's from the Philippines, where the New People's Army, the NPA, ambushed an army patrol near a, um, near a village called Kachamanog and uh, killed some of the young squaddies uh, in the army, uh, three or four of them, left their bodies where the ambush had occurred, which was a stream near the village from which the villagers got their water and said to the villagers, as a lesson, you leave the bodies where they are. Now this so outraged the local people that all the women in the village and the parish priest got together, they went in procession, they picked up the bodies of these kids, they took them out of their water supply, and they gave them a decent burial. And they then started to think about how can we possibly live in this situation any longer. And they came up with the idea, well, there are some people up in Luzon who are putting together these, these peace communities. So that frequently seems to happen. Something happens that so outrages people that they say, we're not going on with this. OK, the second thing that we learned is that one of the really important things in keeping things going in the, inside the community once it's been set up is um, internal democracy, agreement, and unity. In a lot of the Colombian places, of course, that was very difficult because there had been constant rivalry between various factions within the peace community. And to bury that and to be united in what they would do and what they wouldn't do was terribly difficult. In Mogotes, for example, which is always held up as the, the supreme example of the, 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 the leading peace in, uh, zone in, in Colombia, there is a furious debate going on and has been about do they grow cocoa or not? You know, do they actually become part of the drug system? It's very profitable. You, know. you want to make money, don't grow tomatoes, grow cocoa. I don't mean you, <laughs> but that's, that's the choice. Third thing, international support for peace communities is enormously helpful. I mentioned Peace Brigades International earlier on. If you can actually get some international attention on your peace community, and that international attention, whether it's Peace Brigades International, Christian peace teams, uh, or you know, anybody who can if there is a threat, if something happens to the village, if something happens to some of the campesinos, 
they can get in touch with somebody who can get in touch with somebody in Washington, D.C., who can get in touch with somebody in Bogota and say, your soldiers aren't doing their job in such and such a place. That helps. Uh, the other thing that we found is that drawing boundaries around the community and being clear about who's in and who's out is very difficult. Um, another anecdote. Um, there was one occasion in one of the communities in Colombia where something like four or five young people, kids of 14 or 15, had been taken by the FARC and employed as auxiliaries, you know, carriers, people who you know, they didn't do the fighting, uh, but they were part of FARC. They were certainly part of FARC in the eyes of the army and the eyes of the local paramilitaries, and so they were constantly under death threat, and they decided they'd had enough of this, and they wanted to join the local peace community. And the question is, how do you do that? You know, I suppose somebody once rather jokingly said, the question is, how do you become a retired gorilla? Mm -hmm. Well, there's one obvious way, uh, but that doesn't do you very much good. Uh, but what does the local community do to talk to the local commander of the army brigade, saying, look, these kids, they were kidnapped, first of all. They really weren't part of the you know, fighting arm of FARC. You know, they're related to people in the village, you know, which, of course, is suspicious in itself. Uh, and they want to come in out of the cold. They want to, you know, want to go back to the village. How do you do that in such a way that they can become full members of a recognized and recognizable peace community when the paramilitaries are going to say, ah, you know, you've got to be kidding. They're probably still just as much guerrilla men. Yeah, they're going undercover. They're not going to become part of your peace community, and we're not going to accept them as such. It takes a lot of very careful negotiation between some of the local villagers who have been given the job of negotiating with the FARC or with the Paras or with the army and um, the uh, business of sort of maintaining membership of the peace community. Nonetheless, uh, they survive and um, they really ought to have the last word. So one of the things that we did in our final report was to quote some of the things that they said. I needn't incidentally add how unbelievably brave these people are, or desperate, or a combination of both of them. Uh, so we asked them what advice they would give to anybody else. This is what one of them said, that they keep moving forward, that they don't let themselves be defeated because of difficulties, because the problems and difficulties only enlarge the process, that instead of fainting because of any great difficulty, they face it with responsibility, and don't do it for themselves or for the moment. Do it for everyone. Do it for your children and all the generations that will come and for all the people that in this moment are yearning for a better tomorrow and a present that is at peace. They're still a long way from that, but there's, some of them are moving towards it. Thanks very much. We do have a book, incidentally, out of this, which is called Zones of Peace, which I'm going to give, well, it is a gift to the library. And if you're interested, there are some flyers for it along that. We have time. Do you want to take a few questions? I'll take a few questions as long as they're, you know, as long as they've got time, I've got time. Since we're podcasting, you just let me bring the mic to you if you have a question. Uh, there was a independent, self-sufficient community set up in the Anos Orientales, Las Gaviotas, and uh, they declared themselves a, an arms-free zone. The FARC came, and they persuaded the FARC to leave their weapons outside. And I've lost track of them. Now, they popped up, oh, 30-odd years ago. D did you hear anything about them at all? It's not one that I've come across, I have to be honest with you. Um, I mean, um, interestingly enough, it's sometimes paradoxically easier to negotiate a kind of a deal like that with the guerrillas than it is either with the army or the paras. So it may be that you know they're still okay. 
But you know, one of the things I haven't talked about, of course, is that obviously that your difficult, the difficulties of a particular community depend very much upon the kind of environment in which you're trying to set up your, you know, your, your, your peace community. Um, we found that it was much easier if you were setting up a, a, a peace community in an area which was unambiguously controlled by one side or the other. You know, the moment, you know, there, there were large areas 30 years ago uh, where the FARC and the ELN had almost complete control, uh, unchallenged. Uh, in fact, our field researcher actually was once a school teacher, but she wasn't working for the government, she was working for FARC. Um, where it gets very hairy, of course, is, is, you know, where there's contention about who controls the area. So I honestly don't know what happened to your, uh, to your particular uh, example, but uh, it, it's, it was often the case in the early days that um, you, know, you could persuade the FARC, or even more so the ELN, who seem to be much more reasonable about this. Uh, all right, you know, uh, the argument they usually used was something like, listen, you, know, you, you guys, you, you guerrillas are, are trying to establish you know, democracy and peace in Colombia. Well, we've established democracy and peace here. So why don't you just leave us alone and let us get on with it? And occasionally that worked. You know, so, uh, but no, I'd be interested to sort of follow up that and, and, uh, and see what happened. Of course, the other thing that, that, that very much affects the fortune of all of these communities is what's the central government doing? You know, and the present government in Colombia uh, is following a policy of what it calls democratic security, uh, which, and actually members of the government have gone before television cameras and said, of course, the thing about these peace communities, they're all guerrilla sympathizers. Now, you know, if the government sort of says that, it does make life a little difficult. Uh, and lastly, what's the role of the Catholic Church or local priests in this movement? Um, I think it varies um, in the following way. Uh, as you, I'm sure you know, if you know Colombia, you know the church is, is not a unified, or you, you know, it's not, not it's not monolithic. And Colombia, of course, was the um, uh, the part of Latin America where liberation theology was, was born. Uh, I think Camilo Torres was a member of the ELN at one point. Yeah, so, yes, you're, yeah, that's right. Um, so in a lot of these places, the local bishop has been of enormous help. The local parish priest has been one of the leaders of the organization of the new, they're often called constituent assemblies because they they sort of hark back to the 1991 constituent, uh, sorry, constitution that sort of says sovereignty resides in the people. And so, okay, we're the people, we've decided to do this. Uh, but then on the other hand, the sort of senior church sometimes looks upon this kind of an activity not very helpfully. I mean, there was one classic case in, I think maybe it was San Diego down in the south, where the local priests had been very, very involved in, you know, in helping set up uh, the peace community, in formulating the, you know, the, the regular meetings, and getting youth, and then support and supported by the local bishop. And then something happened, and I, I, I've not been able to find out what. They were both suddenly they were fun, suddenly they found themselves transferred, and the next priest to come in was highly unsympathetic to what they'd done. I mean, we actually got some, one of the people who, who Sarah interviewed saying, um, well, the, you know, the priest came and started to preach against a lot of what we were doing, and I, d I wasn't worried about it, but, you know, my ch children would come home and say, you know, the, the, you know, f the father doesn't, doesn't approve of what you are doing, father. Uh, so it, 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 it does vary a lot, but Almost all the successful ones that we've looked at that have hung on and, you know, they've had, they've had support from CNEP or Justicia y Paz. The other people who are doing a lot of good work down there are the Mennonites, oddly enough, for a very small church. Uh, they're doing a lot of good work down there. I was wondering if the peace communities themselves arm or defend in, in some way. <laughs> 
Well, most of them don't. Most of them, the very first thing they do is they say, you know, we're, this is a zone of peace, it's a zone of nonviolence. Uh, no, you know, we, we are certainly not going to arm ourselves. Um, and there are good reasons for that, um, you know, aside from, you know, being against violence while toting an AK-47 is a bit of a difficult moral position to take up. Um, but the other thing is that um, there have been efforts by uh, both um, departmental governments and the national government to establish what they call self-defense forces. And, and Uribe, the new president, well, he's not new, the current president, when he was the um, governor of Antioquia, was notorious for uh, bringing into being a whole series of what were called self-defense forces that were supposed that were armed and supposed to look after the local community. And they sort of immediately became part of this paramilitary organization that was very strong up in northern Antioquia. Uh, so exactly the same thing happened in, in the Philippines. You know, a lot of local communities, at the insistence of the government, armed themselves to the teeth. And I mean, all, all that happened was that they then got embroiled in the fighting. Um, so most of the peace communities that we've looked at in Colombia, the very first thing they say they're not going to do is that they're not going to have ar they're not going to have arms will not be carried within the community. You know, the implication is we won't have them. Don't you bring them in? So. The second question I had was um, kind of more more generally within the um, American debate um, on. On this, I, was, I was wondering if you have any um, insights on the Department of Peace or, or things like that. Um, on, sorry, the? the I, it's just something I've been, I've been hearing about. I think Krasinich maybe is, is the one that um, kind of st started suggesting it, but I've been hearing about um, grassroots campaigns to have a United States Department of Peace. I don't know if that's something that's been, been talked about within the halls where you are. Um. Yeah, well, in a sort of paradoxical way, my institute is the result of the failure of the campaign to set up a Department of Peace. Um, because, I mean, this, um, I mean th there is, as you, I'm sure you know, a U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, which was the result of a campaign that started, um, I think, in the year of the bicentennial of your unfortunate decision to... Uh, rebel against uh, your lawful sovereign, George III. Uh, but apparently in, in, what was it, 1977, have I got the date right? Um, there was, a, a, they started a campaign uh, to take up, I think it's Thomas Jefferson's idea about, you know, if there was, a, if there's a Department of War, there ought to be a Department of Peace. And people started to revive that, particularly a senator from um, Hawaii, Spark Matsunaga. And eventually what happened was it, um, it got sort of transformed in, from a department of peace into an institute of peace, which was in the eyes of many of the people on the peace campaign emasculated by the fact that it was only allowed to, uh, it, it wasn't allowed to actually practice any peacemaking activities because that was the job of the State Department. The State Department should have, sorry, undermined that. And so uh, the Institute of Peace was a kind of a sop to all of the people who for about the previous five years had campaigned for a Department of Peace. And I, I think, um, I think the story goes that it was, the bill was I think signed by Jimmy Carter and then almost immediately afterwards, that Hollywood actor chap came in as president and refused to fund it. Right, so that it, was on, it, was on the, it was on the books, but I think eventually in about 1984, 1985, President Reagan gave something like four and a half million dollars for the Institute of Peace. Uh, I mean, where we come into it is that actually some of the people who were part of the peace, Department of Peace campaign had as a, as a vision that it would be a teaching organization as well as a practice organization. And they were you know, monumentally disappointed. And so they went out to this sort of strange new university out in Northern Virginia and said, 
you know, would you like, would you think about setting up a teaching department in peace and conflict? And the president, who was an interesting guy called George Johnson at the time, he was president when I came, sort of said, oh, well, you know, let's, let's try it. And if people want to come and study it, then yes, we'll set it up. That's where my institute comes from. Do you think there's any, any climate in the United States now to have any, any move in the direction that, that the original campaigners might have wanted? I wish I could say yes, but I don't think that there is, to be honest with you. Um, I've seen no signs of it in Washington, D.C. Uh, that doesn't mean that much. I mean, I'm not sort of privy to what the hell is going on in D.C. generally. But I, you know, I haven't seen any, any, any move to revive that idea, I'm sorry to say. Go at the gentleman at the back. I, I missed the first part of your lecture. I'm just curious, what, what, what is the role then as, as you go into a country or into a region? What is it exactly that, that you do? You go in and teach? Are you, you model? You, uh, you find people who are interested in, in the concept? Um, we, we being the Institute, um, we really do three things. Um, you know, we have a master's program and a PhD program and now a, a, an undergraduate major in peace and conflict studies. Actually, it's conflict analysis and resolution, we call it. Uh, so we have about, oh, about 150 master's students, about 100 PhD students, some of whom allegedly are finishing their dissertation. Uh, and so that's one thing we do. The other thing we do is we, you know, we write books and articles and one thing or other. But there's a very strong emphasis in George Mason University at, not, I mean, not just in my institute, but GMU generally, but particularly in, in ICAR, uh, that, uh, you know, you have to be a, what Kurt Lewin called a practical theorist. I mean, it's no good sort of sitting around so, so what we do, I mean, we help other universities in other countries establish similar kinds of programs. Uh, if we are invited, uh, we sometimes act as facilitators or consultants, uh, or uh, we sometimes run dialogues uh, between representatives of parties who are at each other's throats, or shorter workshops. Um, you know, for example, um, a colleague of mine, Terence Lyons, and I, and some of our ABD students ran a, uh, a dialogue between uh, members of the various Ethiopian diasporas in downtown Washington for something like three years, once a month on a Saturday, to try to paint a picture of a, an Ethiopia in the year 2020, which they could live with. Now, you know, these were not decision makers, but, you know, diasporas actually do have often a significant input into policy making. So what we were trying to do with these guys was just give them some ideas that would sort of at least be available if there ever came to be a time when the government got, would get together with the Oromo Liberation Front or with some of the Western Somali Liberation Front and start talking about an alternative to a centralized federal structure for Ethiopia. Um, on the other hand, we got asked by the, some members of the Basque government a couple of years ago, could we run a one, I think it was a one week, maybe 10 days workshop, where they got a whole series of people from the different Basque parties together to put together a common negotiating, negotiating platform to take to the government in Madrid. So, you know, we, we do all sorts of things. Um, what we, what, we, what we do less of these days is the foot in the door strategy. You know, we don't go and offer uh, to do things very often. People tend to come to us now. Um, you know, and the, the reason for that is we're, we're, you know, at the moment we're overwhelmed with teaching. Um, so that's sort of what we do. And what we were doing in Yerevan, for example, was trying to help them set up a, 
a, a, a teaching program. So you, you kind of, you make resources available to these people, type of thing, or, or connect, you're kind of, besides being a, a therapist of sorts that goes in and tries to mediate things, you, you, you've hooked them up with, with resources and... Yeah, yeah. my wife's a therapist. There you go. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just an academic. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're doing out of, out of this project, which is sort of ongoing, I mean, the, the book is a, um, you know, something that we sort of got to two years ago. Uh, what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to put together a website um, in English and Spanish uh, where all of the stuff that we've gathered about peace communities in the Philippines, in Colombia, uh, there's, there are a couple in Burma, believe it or not. Uh, the ones that were in El Salvador. There are a couple in Sri Lanka. All of these, if we can pull together some information about what they are, how they were set up, how they work, put it on the web and make it available. You know, so anybody who's got you know, access to the internet can start looking at these things and say, hey, that's interesting, maybe we can. So that's another one of the other projects we're doing on almost no money. <laughs>